Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today I really mean that because for the first time, perhaps the second time in the history of the podcast, we are joined by multiple guests. Not just any guests, but two guests that have both been on the show previously and are now pseudo or partners of the show. So first, let's welcome Kirsty, who has just been promoted to a VP, either Rev or Sales Ops, Kirsty. Revenue operations, yeah. VP of Revenue <laughs> Ops at Signal. Is it Signal or Signal AI? It's now Signal AI. Yeah, cool. well spotted. We've also rebranded the company. <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, congrats on the promotion. Thank you. Kirsty was guest number three. Yeah, something like days. that. Of yeah. the very early days. And then we are also joined by Mr. Kevin Rabin, who is the president, founder and president of SOPSA, which is the sales ops. Something. <laughs> Kevin, you're going to have to help me out here. It's the Global Sales Ops Association. Yes, of course. Kevin was guest number 38. Um, so, Kevin, welcome back to the show. Well, hey, thanks. It's great, it's great to be here. And, Kirsty, I didn't know about the promotion. Congratulations. <laughs> well deserved. Thank you very much. And so what we're going to be doing in this discussion is focusing deep into a topic which is probably running through the minds of most sales slash robots people right now, which is, of course, the forecast for 2021. And so I'm going to kick off the show by asking a question to both guests. How have the last nine months impacted sales forecasting? Do you want to go first, Kat? Um Absolutely. Ladies always go first. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I guess I guess the obvious thing to say is that it made it a lot harder at first. Um, I think the the first two months especially were just in, incredibly difficult because it was I I I joke around the, the word unprecedented. I think all of us are hoping for some precedented times to come back, but it was entirely, you know, none of us had been through it before. We didn't know where it was going to go, we didn't know what to expect. So of course Forecasting became incredibly difficult and um, also cash flow. Uh, you know, some, some clients that quickly were kind of shutting it and um, battening down the doors and that became an issue, especially for, uh, you know, smaller companies. Um, and it was a real challenge. So I think it became more important from a, from a, a as a, as a RevOps manager, um, perspective to keep the pipeline up to date because we weren't in the office um, and we couldn't communicate, communication also became harder. Um, you didn't have that constant dialogue with your, with your colleagues being around you. And I, I speak from experience. I think we all know that often when you look at a, a pipeline, understanding um, what what the nuances of each deal is or are uh, can be can differ across sales reps. So obviously we've done many efforts in the past to, to um, kind of prevent that happening. But I think it can make became even more important so that whoever was looking at the pipeline could look at the key metrics and make an assessment based off that. So the accuracy of the pipeline and the consistency of the pipeline across across all of the teams from renewals and upsells to new business became incredibly um, important. And over to you, Kevin. Obviously, I assume that you are speaking or you're, you interface with many sales ops people. What are you hearing are the challenges as per what have been presented to us because of the last nine months? Yeah, you know, with, with all of our members, you know, we we get different, multiple variant uh, types of forecasting. But it really boils down to three types of forecasting that we all rely on. I kind of refer to it as that hurricane chart. If you're in if you're in Florida and you've got a hurricane coming at you from the Atlantic Ocean, you've got multiple models that try to figure out where that thing's going to land. And, and in sales, we we usually have three. We have historical forecasting. We have that manual roll up forecast, and then we have that if you are. You know, if you're currently using new tools, regression analysis or AI based forecasting. And honestly, with, with those three different forecast types, they had been working pretty well because you were able to get a, a clear indication of kind of what your max and min probability was and, and get a sense of direction and speed. And, but now with, with the, the crisis that we've been hit with, our historical forecasting has gone out the window. So it's not nearly as useful as it used to be. And because regression analysis relies so much on that historical forecasting and all the different variables in that, that's also having to readjust. And we're going to, it's going to take a time for our AI-based forecast to readjust. So what that means is this whole function of the manual forecast that we do um, within our sales teams is, is, is 
getting extreme focus. And it's those companies that have that had a bit of a dysfunction maybe in that roll-up process that are suffering because now there's more intense focus put on the manual forecast. Now, the good thing about it is when you do the manual forecast, it's even less about the, the outcome. The, the real benefit of doing a manual forecast is literally the process you go through and, and being real with yourself as a rep, getting the sales managers to be able to coach and, and to work through you know, territory management and opportunity management with their reps. And so this last nine months has, for the healthy companies, it has allowed them to focus more on that time that, uh, that they spend in that manual forecast and get real about where their deals are, what are the real next steps, what do they really need to you know, cut bait on and move away from, where are those um, potentials usually within existing accounts for upsell, because that's usually the easiest place to go. So I see a lot of customers and a lot of, a lot of our members that are looking at how do we expand in our existing accounts even more, because the, the net new business is harder to come by. So I, I think that the big impact has been on getting real with that, that manual uh, roll-up of your forecast. Very clear breakdown. Thank you, Kevin. So more impetus is on this manual forecast. And at the same time, we're also looking more at forecasting renewals versus new business. Going forward into 2021 then, Kirsty, what are you guys doing to try and improve the accuracy of that manual forecast? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, again, underpinning the, the, the forecast uh, and the the metrics that we use for the forecast stay, stay the same. But I think one thing that we need to to learn and that we'll be doing differently is, is being a bit more agile in terms of how we approach that. Um, certainly communication across the teams as well. So right the way we used to have a a fairly siloed approach, really. I guess we would we would have a forecasting, you know, done in the FPNA team, and and it would use the the data in the in the CRM and the the tools that we use um, without necessarily um, involving the, the wider team. And I think one thing that we do now is across the customer service team, the sales team, and the finance team, we we work really closely together. So we all have a very clear view of new um, and renewing business and, and invoicing and collections as well. So when you so. Focusing on, on improving the communication between those teams, does this mean like a 15-minute daily Zoom stand-up? Or does this mean you, you, you all share like docs and you work through stuff together? Maybe that's a very basic question. Uh, no, no, it's, it's good. We actually, um, when we all started working from home to improve the communication, we started, we, there was a, I mean, exactly like what, what Kevin just said, you know, there's increased um, focus on revenue retention uh, as well as as well as uh, net revenue retention, quarterly revenue retention, and then the new business on top of that uh, and the upsell. So um, we started to have a weekly meeting with all the relevant stakeholders in it for each metric. So we went from, you know, having management meetings um, and, and various, I guess, kind of, you know, other, other siloed meetings. So we now have a weekly retention, revenue retention meeting. We have, we already had pipeline meetings, obviously, you know, often the most focus is on the, on the upcoming deals. Uh, we have an upsell meeting and we, we also have a, a big deal meeting. So we took each SaaS metric that was really important and was affecting the forecast. And, and we suddenly had, you know, like every business concerns about and we have a weekly meeting uh, and work stream for those uh, for those metrics and, and actions as to how we can maintain them or improve them or you know know exactly what's happening with them. Make, makes sense. And I like the idea of breaking down those meetings to specific metrics. So there'll be one meeting just focused on this specific SaaS metric. That that seems like those meetings. Uh, well, you're probably making more progress in the meeting. This seems a bit more um, digestible, if the word that I think I'm looking for. Yeah, I think one thing that really worked for us. So in, in those meetings, we have marketing. I mean, it varies slightly, obviously, depending on the metric. But we have sales enablement um, or commercial enablement, as they're called uh, in, in in my team, because they work across. CS uh, and, and all the sales rep levels. Uh, we have the marketing team, we have leadership, we have FPNA, obviously me and the various sales managers or CS managers in there. So it keeps us really honest with the actions. Um, and, and it's really good from a break, right at the very beginning. It was all about like working. There were some blind spots that we had, you know, we're, we're a startup scale up st stage company. So we definitely don't have all the answers. And to be honest, there were areas that we, we suddenly realized we were really blind in. We, we didn't measure the metrics potentially as, as, as closely as we should be. So initially we were 
working out where we were with those metrics, what was happening, where, which way were we trending. Um, and then it was all about as a collective working together across all the different functions as to how we could, um, you know, address or, or, you know, if it was, if it was okay for now, how do we keep it that way? Um, and then now it, it's, then it became what are the actions? Um, and then it was like, you know, team working between, um, the meetings, but knowing that there's always that weekly meeting, I think we've, probably most listeners will be familiar with if you've got that meeting each week and that cadence of having to give an update and mm. and uh you know say where you are with your actions especially if your name's against it then it really does drive that um the actions to have, probably happen a bit quicker than they would otherwise the accountability yes exactly now, kevin going back to your point about the three types of forecasting do you think then that let's say in three years touchwood another virus happens then the other two, the AI and the other one you mentioned, uh, forecasting strategies are not going to be effective again. And so does that mean that actually we should just be spending our time on this manual forecasting strategy? Because the other two are, are, are only reliable if the last three years of uh, data don't have uh, anom- anomalies in well, I think you still have to have those for a sense. Cent- there's seasonality to a lot of companies, you know, so there, there's going to be seasonality that you're still going to see uh, that, that that's going to change. I think it, what it's going to do is it's going to force us to get more granular in those historical and those AI forecasts around different customer segments and how they perform differently and maybe even ge- different geographies. We all know companies that are, you know, they're few and far between that have really benefited from this time. Right. And so those customer segments thrown in with those in maybe hospitality or travel, if you're looking at that as an average, you're going to have a serious problem. So if we, what it's going to force us to do is get more granular about segmenting our customers and how they perform in various different types of disruptions. And hopefully what this will do is it'll, you know, there's disruption all the time if you look at it at that level, whether it's an energy company and the price of oil and gas is going up and down or um, whether it's a, you know, the, the pharma companies and different regulations that happen, you know, maybe what this will do is it'll actually force us to get more granular and stop treating our customers as though they're one um, specific kind of persona and, and, and get more granular about it. And if we get to that point and we learn from that, then we're going to be able to, to come out of this with better forecasting models, regardless of what happens in any ma- major market or micro market. I, th- yeah, I think I, I actually yeah, could add to that. Yeah, so, yes. yeah we, we've we've just it just sparked something that Kevin said. So we've just started uh, kicked off our, our Q1 2021 planning and, and forecasting today, actually. And one of the things that we're we're doing is, you know, obviously one of the the, the key metrics you'd look at historically was conversion rate, and that's something that we have always monitored and tracked. Um, it wasn't one of our blind spots. You'd be glad to know. Um, but now, in, instead of just looking at it, you know, maybe year to date or previous twelve months, or you know, because it never really fluctuated that much. Um, instead, we are looking at it much more granularly. So for, um, it's quite a tactical thing. Um, we're now looking at in terms of volume and value. Previously, we always looked at it in terms of value with having a mind on the volume, obviously, but we didn't necessarily use that as, as part of our approach. Um, and then also, instead of we're looking at um, like a trailing three months, a trailing six months, seeing how that's trending and the different stories that it tells. And then also looking at it in different timeframes, like year to date and year on year. And, and, and we are looking at that historical data to see how it's changed. And then we're using... All of those numbers, instead of just picking one, you know, we're not just which going which which other one we think is more accurate, because uh, they're all just paying, they're all looking at the same data set and just telling it, telling it in a different way. So we're taking a mix of all of those to work out what conversion rate should we be looking at and using, um, and maybe you know conversion rates, multiple ones um, in our forecast for next year. So if I was to ask, ask a question, how can we create a sales forecast that is crisis proof? Is the answer to that question segmentation? I feel that it, I would, I would proof or resistant. <laughs> um, I, I think mm-hmm. resistant or, or, or agile um, is that's where you have to get. You have to get down to that point. And I think one of the things we need to be looking at too is is our definition of things like productivity. You know, we, oftentimes we're looking at the. Uh, we're, we're making a big push to reduce cycle times, regardless of the type of, of, of sales cycle we're in. And, you know, activity times quality equals productivity, right? That's kind of the, 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 the calculation. But when you divide all that by time, that's when you, you realize that, you know, in the time like we're going through right now, the, the time that we spent is, is getting extended or in some cases getting radically reduced as people maybe if you're selling a digital enablement product, right? Um, so 
segmentation is, is and micro segmentation is important. And then also understanding where the real value added activities are for our sales team to direct their actions, right? There, there may be certain things that, that we cannot do and our cycle times are going to get extended and, and it's unnatural to try to press a, a rep or, or a customer to do something in an unnatural time when something like this occurs, right? So we have to get really real about what are the value added steps that a rep can take? Where do they need to spend their time? And, you know, we do as much as we can in certain segments, knowing that the time is going to get extended. And then we accelerate our investment of activities in other segments because those are on a fast track, right? So um, I think it's a kind of a combination of those things. Got it. And Kirsty, you were saying that you you guys have, uh, starting the forecast today, have already started to adopt additional segmentation to help with 2021. Yeah, yeah. But just to be clear, we're not we're not going to use the segmentation approach to like look at different areas of our business and apply a different. Me- I think we're still going with a more broad approach because I think once you once you get when when you're trying to do a, a, a forecast for a um, you know a, a year or a quarter, I think when you try and get far too detailed and far too granular, I think you can actually then lose some of the some of the power of kind of the the broader strokes that you can take. So I, I think I totally agree. Um, that actually the, the ability to predict the change in things like sales cycle or value or conversion rate or the size of your pipeline at each stage it, is, is it so valuable as it can be um, that predictor for, for the performance. Um, so the question becomes more clearly about being able to predict the change, whether that's going to be positive or negative, and then move towards processes that can increase positives or, or lessen the negatives um, and so hit the forecast that way. Makes sense. Do we think anything has irreversibly changed within re- revenue operations over the past nine months? That's over. I'm sending that over to Kevin. Well, I have a hope. I hope that one of the things that's irreversibly changed is that it's it's started to break down some silos. We, you know, so often as we 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 get to the running different departments or different functions, you know, build those siloed walls. And what we don't realize is that that day one mentality of a of a small company that that where every function has to work together tightly to make things happen is really where we need to be operating no matter how big or how old our company is. So, you know, in times like this, it forces us to work closer together across functions, work on a more common set of metrics and dashboards and work in a cadence that that's more connected. I hope that has changed for the better and in, 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 in that's a irrevocable change. Uh, that, that's one of my hopes. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I entirely agree that the increased communication and the alignment, um, I, you know, the, the meetings that we have around each metric, I'm quite confident that they'll be here to stay. Um, and that's something that, it, that we all see the benefit, benefit of across all of our functions. Um, and I also think that the alignment between sales and marketing um, and the fact that, that we're all working from home, it really fo- refocuses the importance of that alignment between marketing and, and, and sales and the marketing operations part of, of RevOps. I think it's more important than ever that we're driving leads to the sales team and capturing the right information for them to be able to sell to those leads, um, but also reps. Um, I think I'm sure everyone in the UK, you know, we we find it very hard now to get direct dials um, because of various, uh, you know, inhibitors. So mm-hmm. enabling rep social selling on LinkedIn, for example, is is really key in ensuring that you are you are where your buyers are and increasing that that's virtual. You know, it's harder to be. You're not there in events. You're not. You can't be networking as much anymore, and you can't necessarily get people on direct dials as much anymore, or as, or as easily as before. You know, you can't even ring the switchboard and, and get through to people that way if people aren't in the office. Um, so, uh, social selling and, and working with marketing for content and things like that is is only increasing uh, and driving that closer alignment. Yeah, Kirsty, I agree with that. And I think one of the other things here is I, I hope that the rapid improvement and digitization that we've had in the because what i've seen is a big a big increase in these digital um selling products and digital selling tools and techniques that we would have you know taken years to to internally sell before um this crisis has thrown us into a place where people aren't asking questions they're just funding those things um and you know my hope is that you know we can prove that these types of tools and these types of approaches are really game changers. And that the next time we go to start asking for investment and things that we can define and that we have a hunch or that we have some, um, some quantified, quantified, um, 
value on that, that we won't uh, get as much pushback <laughs> that the digital transformation that has that has moved started moving so quickly will continue uh, that that is a hope for me hmm. so the the virus pushed forward many trends that were already happening remote work e-commerce are we saying then that the virus has also pushed forward the trend we're seeing from sales sales ops to revenue ops Good question. Uh, if, I'll, I'll let Kirsty answer, but for me, the, the way I see it, RevOps is 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 a function that has become more and more important in a certain size company at a certain level in their maturity. For the really large companies, RevOps is difficult, an even more difficult thing to pull off because of those ingrained silos across mm-hmm. marketing and customer success and, and sales and sales ops. So, but um, you know, within a, a medium size or fast growth company, um, you know, the only person who can speak to that would be Kirsty. What do you think? Is it happening? Yeah, definitely. And that, that was actually, we're skipping ahead to my, my prediction. Um, I think if it, if it hasn't happened or isn't happening now, I think it's going to gather, it's going to happen. It's definitely the move to revenue operations is, is going to gather pace. Uh, I think, I think the crisis has underlined the importance of the role uh, and the reliance of looking at a large number of data points instead of just being, you know, siloed on the, the new business side of things. Certainly at Signal, we, we've definitely found that, you know, that we were probably a little bit too more focused on that side of things and maybe let, let other things um, not be in as much of a focus as they are. So we're looking at everything as one piece, so CS marketing and sales is is it's just really emphasized the importance of that. Um, and I think the the prediction for, for me was going to be that companies will assist on greater communications and alignment across the teams. Um, and with that as well, better data accuracy and cleanliness. So yeah, I think that um, I predict that will happen. And I've spoken actually this week, we, um, we, we've we got some uh, investors at Signal and, and they um, invest in some really early stage companies, which is a really great opportunity for me because there's quite a few um, like C- COOs, for example, in, in like seed stage companies who are um, Thinking about um, their first hires, or they've, you know they've got a few a small like small sales team, and, and they're thinking about making that ops hire. So um, I often get put on the phone to them to discuss different options, and just you know I'm not necessarily making recommendations, but I'm just talking to them about experiences that, that I have. And because we at signal we started with rev ops, and then we're, we've transitioned to uh, sorry we started to sales ops, and we've tra- transitioned to rev ops, and I think increasingly. Um, re- and a revenue ops higher, uh, revenue operations higher is is becoming a really early stage higher. Uh, and the, the the benefit of having someone who has that insight and can have a look at the systems across the different departments and make decisions and recommendations to the to the department leads based on a holistic view of, of the business and the commercial function is just so valuable um, that I've definitely seen. It may be a self-fulfilling prophecy because these are people that our investors are asking me to speak to. Um, but I've definitely seen uh, p- people really interested in, in revenue operations and, and not necessarily um, sales operations because they can see the benefit. But like Kevin says, it's a lot easier in smaller companies because to make that, that, you know, either right from the beginning, you know, obviously it's easy to make that decision or a, a small way in because it's a much more agile environment than the bigger company. So I think... You are right that the, the two ends of the spectrum will have different experiences with that uh, move from sales ops to prep ops. So we'll jump over to Kevin for a one prediction uh, or priority in 2021 for revenue operations, which Kirsty should leave you with enough time <laughs> to, to prep another one. Kevin, over to you. Um, I'll, let's talk about planning, right? I think typically we plan at a year with a year cycle in mind. And we don't know what this coming year is going to be like. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to start planning in quarters and halves, uh, knowing that we can prepare to adjust. So everything that we do is going to need to be built in such a way that we can adjust no matter what happens mid-year. We, we could completely open wide back up in the summer. Right. And and if that's the case, then we're going to need to have compensation plans that don't have to be completely changed from scratch, but can be manipulated based on the way they were built. Uh, that's one thing. We need to have territory designs and 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 so forth that that makes sense for that. And if we decide that we're going to take um, our our movement to you know everybody is an inside seller today, regardless mm-hmm. of if you were a field seller or before, you're all inside now. And um, you know we're going to have to make a decision. You know, early on, how are we going to either push for everybody to really move to an inside sales role, and how does that impact the people that we have? Um, or we're going to have to, you know, find um, 
technology technologies and training and, and techniques to, to maintain those higher dollar, higher impact experienced field salespeople we have and knowing that they may still be functioning on the inside for the, for the full year, or they may get to turn right back to what they had done before mid year. Right. So, you know, I'm talking, it's just really planning to be agile um, and not, not building things that are so um, tightly coupled that, when this environment changes, it just breaks everything. We have to start from scratch. Yeah. As you were going through that, I'll say in my head, the word agility uh, was just, it came to me. And so I'm glad that you, you touched upon that right at the end. Um, makes total sense. Kirsty, back over to you. Um, so prediction, um, as, as I said, one that I covered earlier, I think in terms of priority, the, the main one that I, I was thinking earlier was around the uh, very much in line with your agility word, um, the ability to monitor changes in these key data sets, which is basically what Kevin's just said. Um, but from a more tactical perspective, you know, the ability to monitor changes, keep an eye on what's happening, alert the business um, and, and alert the, the relevant stakeholders to any changes that impact that forecast uh, in any way. But then ultimately, obviously, the ability as a, as a company and as a business and as a revenue function to be able to act swiftly on the alerts in a way that you know isn't going to isn't going to cause any friction it's going to have the ma- maximum success which is is often the tricky balance between like do we do we change it is what impacts changing things going to have um you know and uh, and yeah and then the ability to forecast with with better speed and, and regularity and accuracy i think the other thing i, I was going to mention and is certainly a, a, a massive priority for me at the moment and my team is that the the, the nature of revenue operations is obviously so broad like you know you're looking after all of looking and responsible for all the processes the tools the the learning and development of of multiple teams and basically the entire revenue function for business so it's it's huge and it means that the the things that you could do are always massive and and one thing that we um we really focus on we don't always get right for sure is is prioritizing in the right way because otherwise you could have a team of 20 people and you're still all you know you, you if you're trying to do everything you're trying to boil the ocean you end up working evenings and weekends and you have a team that the, you know the, the can't take pride in the work maybe things aren't getting completed to the the satisfaction you would like to take in your work um so what we try and do is really really prioritize what are the things that as a revenue uh, team in the business we need to work on and need to give time to and and dedicate resource to and let's make those changes and work together as a team on them instead of trying to do everything um and with that keeping an eye on, on people's mental health like we're all, like, most of us are working from home seven days a week uh, seven well, sometimes seven feels like seven, uh, five days a week um, at the moment. And we really, really miss that human interaction. And already, you know, we've been working from home for, for nine months or something, as you say. And already I can feel like relationships that I had with people in the office, maybe outside of my immediate team, uh, like, you know, you, you don't, you, they're just not as good as they used to be in terms of being able to just quickly like be like, oh, can, can you do me a favor? Or what do you think about this? And um, not having that constant communication is is really having a detrimental effect. So one thing that I'm always really keen on is is keeping an eye on the team. And now that we've just had a lockdown with um with we're in darkness. If you don't get out on a lunchtime, you get up in the dark and you go you go to bed in the dark and it can be easy to not even leave the flat during lockdown, you know. So keeping an, a priority for me is is prioritizing and keeping an eye on the team team's kind of well-being as well you know little changes like sitting next to a window so you get more daylight you know we're not nocturnal animals we, we should be getting daylight we don't we're not meant to live in the dark um encouraging them and you know giving permission to them to block out time you know it just, you, you can be really really busy but do block out time for your lunch break to get outside go to the shop or, or something get a little breather um we've just started doing something which i i love as a company our cco started it and, and we've kind of adopted it you can end up being in back to back meetings from nine till six and or later if you, you know, with our US uh, office. So we've started scheduling our meetings at 10 past the hour or five past the hour. Cause we, we start, we try to adopt the Google speedy meetings thing where we, um, the meetings are supposed to finish early, but it just never happened because we knew that, you know, everyone was free to the hour. So what we do now is we start them slightly later and that just breaks up the day a little bit and means that people can get away from the laptops. You know, if it's, if it could be replying to emails, replying to slacks, getting a cup of tea, having a comfort break. Um, and it just helps people to not be so overwhelmed all the time. So that's a, a priority for, for, for my team as well at the moment. Makes total sense. I, I like to close out actually with something that Kevin referred to briefly in one of his answers. And you mentioned that 
this may be an opportunity for us to create more robust forecasts. And then also going back to what you were saying right at the end, Kirsty, is that we should be looking after our mental health. And therefore, this is also an opportunity for us to think more about that. So when we do move into 2021, we're more prepared with the forecast, but we're also more prepared with our teams to be more productive and to lead happier and healthier work lives. So, Kevin, thank you so much for joining. Kirsty, thank you so much for joining. Is there anything you would like to, to leave the audience with specifically around focuses for 2021 before we close out? Oh, I can't think of anything. Kevin, have you got a, a nice, valuable piece to leave it on? <laughs> uh, I'll say this. You know, this forces us to go back to the basic principles of sales ops and rev ops. What, what are they? Why are we here? Because like, like Kirstie said, we can become kind of the junk drawer of the business because we take on so many things and we sit at the crossroads of the business all the time. And so one of the things that I really try to help people do is, is focus on well, why do we exist and what, what are the things that, that we're there to impact year over year, regardless of if it's a difficult time. And there's three things that I like to talk about. I say, look, we need to be actively managed. We need to make sure that we're managed on purpose, we're disciplined, and we're always getting better at our processes, right? But if we're only that, we become sales prevention. And we, we don't want to be that, mm. right? So we have to also make sure that we're, we've got a foot in the easy to sell for category. We need to be helping our company be easy to sell for. And in times like this, where everything's thrown up like a deck of cards, we have to focus even more on what are we doing to be easy to sell for? And some of that comes down to those things like Kirsty was talking about around just mental health and, and, and culture. How do we grow a culture and maintain it during this time? And what tools and processes and communications techniques are we going to do with people? You know, how, how do we do that? We need to be focused on easy to sell for as well. And then finally, the third piece is, is high performance culture. You know, how can we Begin, you know, continue to reinforce that we as a company need to have a high performance culture that, that values learning, that values growing and getting better and challenging oneself and, and encouraging and mentoring other people. And then we happen to build high performance sellers on top of that culture, right? So, you know, look at your, my challenge to everybody on the call would be to look at the initiatives that you have going on today and put a little dot next to these three things. What, what, are, which of your initiatives are focused on being actively managed, which ones are on easy to sell for, and which ones are on culture. And if you find that you're out of balance, go back and reconsider how you can get back in balance because you need to have all three of those things in balance, especially as we go into 2021. It's a good time to look at them. Beautifully finished, Kevin. Thank you so much. Guys, I want to thank you for your support of the podcast, both with your time in the original episode and this episode, and also as now new partners to the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Tom.